Good morning, everyone. So we are starting a brand new sermon series this morning that focuses on our emotions, on our feelings. But if you're like me and like many other Christians today, you may have been taught to think that we do not have permission to consider our feelings. We don't have permission to name our feelings or to express them openly. Because after all, emotions and feelings are not to be trusted. They can go up and down like a roller coaster. And the last thing we should be attending to in our spiritual lives as Christians is our emotions and feelings, right? No, that's not right. Just automatically writing off our feelings and emotions as being unimportant or petty or even sinful, I believe that's an incorrect view. It's unmanaged emotions. It's unchecked feelings that can lead us into sin. And I'll say this, emotional health is an essential part of who we are as men and women made in God's image. And Scripture actually reveals God as having emotions. Here are just a few. First one is Genesis chapter 1, verse 25, and then again in verse 31. It says, God saw that it was good. God saw all that He made, and behold, it was very good. So in other words, God delighted, He relished, He beamed, He delighted over us. He was emotional over creation. Then we see a completely different emotion. Genesis 6.6, 6, it says the Lord was sorry that He made man on the earth, and He was grieved in His heart. What about Jeremiah 31.3? I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have drawn you in with loving kindness and compassion. And finally, Matthew 26, starting with verse 37, it says, Jesus began to be grieved, and he was distressed. Then Jesus said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. So we are human beings made in God's likeness. And part of that likeness is to feel emotions. Scripture never tells us that we shouldn't have emotions or strong feelings. But how do we control and manage and care and most importantly, surrender these emotions, these feelings, to God in a healthy and honorable way? That's the question. And we're going to study the answer to that question for the next five weeks here at church. And we're going to target and zone in on five big emotions over these next five weeks. Regret, anger, loneliness, fear, and today we're going to focus on apathy. So what is apathy? What does apathy really mean? Well, maybe you've heard the old tale of a person asking their friend what the difference was between ignorance and apathy. He asked, what's the difference? And the friend responded like this, the difference between ignorance and apathy? I don't know, and I don't care. So without realizing it, they answered the question, didn't they? The I don't know was the ignorance. The I don't care, that's the apathy. So to be apathetic really means that we could give two hoots. Apathetic comes from the Greek word apathos. So the A cancels out or negates the pathos. So pathos means to have pity or compassion. So apathos or apathetic means that we have no feeling, no emotion, and we are just indifferent to things. 
And there are times in life when we may really not seem to care all that much about anything. We can become indifferent to circumstances. We can become indifferent to relationships with other people. We can even become indifferent to Christ. If you have your Bibles, Revelation chapter 3 is where we're going to be heading. There are Bibles at the bottom of your seats if you want. You can get there on your phone. Revelation is all the way in the back of your Bible. So we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Revelation 3, 14 through 22. And as you're getting there, let me say this. We're going to see here that we are at the end of a letter written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. Asia Minor is now modern-day Turkey. And that was the birthplace of Christian churches. And this is a letter here, the seventh letter to the city of Laodicea. And as we read this, remember, this is Jesus Himself writing this through the Apostle John. So in a sense, Jesus is speaking these words to the Laodiceans. So if that's true, it's also as if Jesus Himself is speaking to us today as we are reading this. So this is something we definitely need to hear and take note of. So Revelation 3, 14 through 22. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched miserable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will be revealed, will not be revealed, and I sell to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Verse 19. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and he and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So of all the seven churches written about here in Revelation, we can make a case that Laodicea is the worst. And every single single one of the six letters in Revelation, Jesus finds something positive to say about them. He has something positive to say about every church, even with all their problems, even with all the issues. He has something good that he finds in them until we get to Laodicea. Jesus says nothing positive. You know, a lot of times we save the best for last, don't we? Not here. With Laodicea, we save the worst for last. And I don't think that was on purpose here in Scripture. So I'm going to make a case that apathy and boredom and indifference with God may be one of the most dangerous spiritual conditions out there. And this letter to the Laodiceans proves that we have to take apathy serious. So today we're going to look at 
the problem of apathy, we're going to look at the causes of apathy, and we're going to look at the solution then to apathy. So let's start with the problem of apathy. If you grew up in church, if you grew up, let's say, in the typical Christian household, if you grew up in a standard cookie-cutter Christian school or environment, then you may have received the message that you need religion, you need God to be respectable, to look respectable, to act respectable. But you don't need so much religion to where you become this crazy radical person. So the message you may have grown up with or the message maybe you told yourself is that you just need a little bit of Jesus added to your life. You want just enough to play the part, but not enough to be considered weird. But Jesus here in Revelation seems to think the opposite of that, doesn't he? So we're talking about apathy here, and it is a real problem in the church. It was a problem back then, and it's still a problem right now as well. And that problem is not just out there. The problem really is inside of us, in our heart. You know, so many times we can look back in our mind and look back in our thoughts. We can think back to the glory days. And we wonder, what happened to all the passion and zeal I used to have? Where did it go? I used to be passionate about the Lord, and now it seems like a lot of times I'm just on autopilot. Or I find myself being lukewarm. How did that happen? If we're being honest, we may struggle with thoughts like these. And these thoughts can happen at any age. This is for young or old. So let me ask a question now. Why does it bother Jesus so much when we have apathy towards Him? Why is it such a big deal to Jesus? And should it be a big deal to us? Well, in verse 14 here, it's interesting how Christ starts out by describing Himself. He describes his own greatness, his own glory, his own beauty, his own majesty. I love, he says, I am the amen. He's saying, that's, I am final. That's that. I am faithful. I am the true witness. I am the first, the last, the beginning, the end. I created everything. I was there at the beginning. I am the Lord. So that means there's no one more glorious or beautiful or wonderful or satisfying than Christ. And that's who we're indifferent to? The problem with apathy, I think, is that we fail to recognize and respond to how magnificent Christ is. We fail to see the great gap that can exist between who Christ is and our measly response to that. That's the problem with apathy. So, yes, this is a big deal to Christ. And it should be a big deal to us as well. And Jesus grabs on to this idea in this letter by using the hot and cold and lukewarm language. He says in verse 15 and 16, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but instead you are lukewarm. Because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out. Now, I often used to misunderstand that. So many people misunderstand this. This does not mean that Jesus wishes you to be either really spiritual or really unspiritual. He's not saying, I wish you were on fire for me, or I wish you were just totally opposed to me. That's not what it means here by using hot and cold. What's really being conveyed here is that 
God wishes we were useful. Cold water is good for refreshment and purity. Hot water is good for healing and soothing and sterilizing. Lukewarm water really does nothing. It's not really sought after. And I want to be honest, this is one of the most difficult things to address, not only in the church, but in our family, our family lives, and in our personal lives. I think we all know people who have apathy, don't we? But you know what? We really need to start by searching ourselves first. We may have grown up in church. We may still attend church. We don't outwardly oppose or hate Jesus. We aren't anti-Christian. We haven't rejected the faith. We think we're fine because we don't really have a beef against church. But there may be nothing going on inside of us. We can still be spiritually dead. Our spiritual pulse doesn't seem to have a heartbeat. There's no growth. There's not much involvement. We aren't reading our Bibles, maybe. We aren't fighting sin. We aren't pursuing Christ. We're just stale. And that staleness, the lukewarmness, Scripture says that actually Jesus will spit us out. That's a serious, dangerous place to be. So that's the problem of apathy. It's serious. Let's analyze the cause of apathy now. There are many things that lead to apathy. It's not just one thing that usually leads us there instantly. There are usually lots of steps down that road. But the one that this letter in Revelation really targets here is self-sufficiency. Let's look at, look at verse 17 again now. Jesus says, Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, or naked. The key there is when it says, I need nothing. Let that sink in for a moment. I am in need of nothing. I think that's, it's hard to imagine a more non-biblical, non-gospel statement than that. That kind of just spits in the face of what God has done for us in, in Christ Jesus on the cross. The message of the gospel is not that we need nothing. It's that we need everything. Without Christ in our lives, we are lost sinners. Without Christ in our lives, we are in rebellion against God. And we need someone to save us. We need someone to forgive us. We need someone to redeem us. We're not okay by ourselves. And the Laodiceans, they're basically saying, I got this. Or in our terms now, I'm crushing this. All good here, God. And that's one of the major causes of apathy. Self-sufficiency. The idea that we are just good as we are and that we really don't need the grace of God. So maybe not consciously, but the self-sufficient person looks at the cross and says, I don't really need that. I don't need a bloody, bruised Savior. I have myself. You know, some people call that the American way. That should not be the American way. That's the ignorance and pride way. 
Self-sufficiency will suck the spiritual life right out of your spiritual walk. Now, I want to make something real clear. The passage is not arguing that wealth is somehow a sin. The problem is not simply having money. The problem is we have to recognize that when we do have money, there are certain challenges that may come with that. We should not put our confidence or our contentment, our purpose, our identity in wealth. So we looked at the problem of apathy. We looked at the cause of apathy. Let's look at the solution now. The solution to apathy. The solution to apathy in this passage is that we are to come back and we are to return to Christ. We are to repent and turn back to Christ with reverence and open humility. Look at verse 19. It says, Those whom I love, I reprove, I discipline. Therefore, be zealous. Zealous means having a strong desire and passion and commitment to follow Christ. It says, be zealous and repent. Repentance is all about recognizing and coming to grips of who we really are without Christ. The wrong that we've done. It's humbling ourselves by recognizing and admitting what we've done and then look and walk and talk in a different way, in a different direction. And Jesus reminds the Laodiceans that they have been looking, they have been doing business in all the wrong places. And he says they should be doing business with God. Go back to verse 18 for a second. Jesus says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich, white garments so that you may clothe yourself, and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed, and I salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Jesus reminds them that they have been looking and shopping in all the wrong places. They need to come to God for their peace and their satisfaction. So the proper cure for apathy is to get a renewed, fresh, deep picture of the greatness of Christ. Taste and drink from Him again. Spend time with Him again. Worship Him again. See His greatness. Talk to Him. Serve Him by serving others in a sacrificial way. And when we do that, we will realize that the things we may have been pursuing that are opposite from that, they're not the most important thing. In fact, sometimes they're harmful and it's garbage. So we need to stop being so pleased with the things of the world because Christ is so much better, isn't He? To fight and counter apathy, we can accept Christ and follow Him. Or we can recommit ourselves to Christ. That's the solution to apathy. I think the best way to close this message is with what I think is the most wonderful part of the message here. Look at verse 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So Jesus doesn't just command us to repent. He doesn't order us, order us to obey like a drill sergeant. He invites us. He pursues us. He lovingly chases us to repent and come back to him. He doesn't bust down the door. He invites us back with gentleness and such grace and such love. 
So for anyone who was wandering, or anyone who may be chasing money, or chasing fame, or popularity, or fortune, chasing whatever, fill in the blank. Here's what Christ says to you. I love you, and I want you. I desire you to come back to me. He doesn't say that out of frustration or self-gain because He doesn't need anything from us. He's not wagging His finger at us and demanding that we come back. He is inviting us to what is best. What is best for our mind and soul and spirit and heart. I talked to someone when they came in this morning. God's not done with us yet. He's not through with us. If we're still on this earth, He's not done. So even if we're here this morning and we are feeling like we've been a little complacent lately, maybe we've been lukewarm, maybe we've been bored, maybe we've been spiritually self-sufficient, God can give us a new life. God can give us a fresh new purpose. So we can take our emotions. We can take our feelings to God. We can surrender them to Him in a healthy and honorable way. And only He can transform that. What a shepherd we have, huh? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we humbly come before You Lord, we repent of the times we have often been apathetic in our life or have been apathetic in our relationship with You. Lord, I ask that You continue to deliver us from spiritual apathy, our lukewarmness that has maybe crept into our lives almost unseen when we drift away from Your grace and Your mercy, Your truth, and Your love for us. Lord, so many times we neglect the things we ought to do and then we do the things that we shouldn't be doing. Lord, we ask for Your forgiveness on that. Thank You for Your Word, Your truth in Scripture. Thank You for this letter here in Revelation. Lord, may we take our feelings and our emotions, may we surrender that to You. May we not be ignorant of this. May we not just brush this off. Brush off and justify the self-sufficiency. Lord, we ask that we be revived by Your Holy Spirit. Thank You, Lord, that when we are faithless at times, You remain faithful and true forever. Lord, may we surrender our apathy that might have crept in May we give it to You. And may we stay close in Your presence as we live our lives for You. We love You, Lord. It's in Jesus Christ's precious name we pray these things. Amen.